Nigerians prepare to head to the polls again. But after delays and allegations of corruption, will the vote be free and fair? I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmaker is Nigeria's presidential election. Last Saturday, Nigeria's election commission shocked the nation by canceling a general election just hours before the vote, citing logistical reasons for a one-week delay. Now, the president immediately called the commission incompetent and declared this Friday a national holiday so that voters could prepare to head to the polls yet again. Mohamedou Buhari also controversially ordered police to be ruthless against anyone caught tampering with ballots, a move some say opens the door to police abuse of power. And still, even though the election commission bought some time to organize another vote, some high-profile observers are not convinced it can be carried out in a few days' time, saying basic voting infrastructure simply won't be ready. Here's Haider Abbasi with more. It was years in the making. The ballots were ready, and millions had traveled across Nigeria to vote. But just hours before the presidential poll was meant to open, this happened. The commission has decided to reschedule the presidential and national assembly elections to Saturday, 23rd February, 2019. Nigeria's Electoral Commission said it needed more time to ensure a free and fair election. Voters weren't pleased. This is a height of incompetence. The country has never experienced this. That election could be called on the day of election. Who does that? As at 12 o'clock, nobody knew that the election was going to be called off. Very disappointing. It's very disappointing. It's very shameful indeed. As a Nigerian, I feel so embarrassed. The leading candidates have accused each other of trying to manipulate the vote. Nigeria's president, Mohamedou Buhari, has criticized the Electoral Commission. The reasons uh, why such incompetence manifests itself uh, has to be explained to the nation. After the election, we have to know exactly what happened. But how will the delay affect the vote? One issue could be a lower turnout. Millions of Nigerians had traveled home where they'd registered to vote. Analysts say many won't be able to do this again. This will harm all the competing parties. And then there's the cost. According to the Lagos Chamber of Commerce and Law, the economy has lost one and a half billion dollars because of the delay. And that could be bad news for Buhari. He appointed the head of the Electoral Commission in 2015. Its apparent lack of preparation could reflect poorly on him. But despite having an extra week to get ready, some observers say it won't be enough. The former vice president of Gambia says he's doubtful the vote will go ahead because of the scale of the work needed. So is Nigeria ready to hold the election this time around? And if so, who will come out on top? Haider Abasi, the newsmakers. Let's speak to our panelists now. And in Lagos, we have Kayori Ogundamisi. He is a member of President Buhari's presidential campaign. Also in Lagos, we have Shegun Shonmuni. He is the campaign spokesman for the opposition leader, Atiku Abubakar. Thanks both so much for joining us. You know, Mohamedou Buhari blamed the Electoral Commission for incompetence uh, for the vote's delay last Saturday morning. He's ordered an investigation now, but election officials say the vote could neither be free nor fair because of logistical reasons. Segun, which one is it? Well, as far as I'm concerned, obviously, like all Nigerians, we take, we're a bit disappointed that uh, they had enough time to plan for an election. They knew the election date. INEC fixed the date. They prepared the candidates. They put the ceiling on when we should stop campaign, and they told us the day that we were all meant to go and, you know, carry like Nigerians, exercise their civic rights. And incidentally, they chose to, whatever reason they had, cancel it just at the last minute, which is like at about 2.33 a.m. before the election was supposed to start at the break of dawn. Obviously, that's not acceptable to anybody. It's not acceptable to Atiku Abubakar. It's not acceptable to the PDP. It's not acceptable to the generality of Nigeria, but that's where here we are. We still must come invest some hope in the process. 
so that we can finish it well, and then eventually there'll be plenty of time to investigate all of that. But as per incompetence, I do not uh, know whether we're able to make those kind of hasty generalization just yet, mm -hmm. because sometimes you have to really look well before you can hastily say this is what has happened and this is what not has happened. In any case, now they've asked Nigerians to be ready to do the votes on Saturday, okay. this coming Saturday, and I believe that by the grace of God, I encourage Nigerians to be enthusiastic to come out and cast their vote and let us get Nigeria working again. Okay. Coyote, let me ask you uh, the same question. Do you believe that the Election Commission was right to cancel this vote, albeit very last minute? They say they want it to be free and fair, and it simply couldn't be if it was held almost a week ago. Our position is that the independence of the electoral body should be respected by all, and it is the prerogative of the uh, uh, Independent Electoral Commission to decide whether the election, whether they are ready or not, but uh, our candidate and the spokesperson for the APC has um, uh, stated, stated it clearly that the campaign is extremely disappointed because there are lots of Nigerians that have traveled across the country to vote. Nigeria is a very huge country. Uh, there are disabled people, people with uh, physical disabilities that have gone through the pain to crisscross the country. And specifically, uh, waking up just less than four, uh, 12 hours in the middle of the night to announce the cancellation, it was extremely disappointing for our candidate and the campaign. But like the president did say, we all need to be patient. We all need to uh, try not to uh, sabotage the system. We need to respect the independence of the Electoral Commission. And uh, an investigation should be carried out. But also, we know that everyone should uh, be responsible for this. Uh, the Electoral Commission did not get the, uh, the approval from the National Assembly for the, mon the, the funds they need. Uh, not until four months to election. I think uh, an election that takes, that we need four years, we just had four months to the release of funds and there are lots of logistic problems that they did say. But like we did say, uh, we have another opportunity this Saturday. We all call on all Nigerians to come out en masse and vote. The right. president has declared uh, a national holiday so that people will be able to uh, crisscross the country. Okay. Well, it sounds like you at least both on the same page as to wanting to move forward and get this election done in a few days' time, even though some rather high-profile election observers are saying it still won't be ready. I don't want to speculate too much on that. We hope this vote will be carried out. But in the run-up to it, uh, Segun, let me ask you, some have criticized uh, your president's call for police to be ruthless uh, with vote riggers. They fear uh, it gives police license to act really almost extra judicially. Do you agree with his statement there? Why is it necessary to give police that kind of license to act as they see fit? I think, you, I think you, you, you're putting it too mildly. He actually said they would do it at the cost of their life, which invariably means he's not understanding that even criminals have the protection and the guarantee of life. For offenses that even our books, people can go down for more than for death sentences, you still need to allow the sanctity of, you know, fundamental human rights for them to be tried. No president what is salt can make those kind of comments. You cannot give the instruction or use your words or give the body language to suggest that you're asking for criminal execution of our people under whatever guise. That's not acceptable in democracy. No, it shouldn't have spoken like that. I had made a statement saying that I believe that he should take it back. And I'd also said that as a citizen of his country, that I apologized on his behalf. We're not going to run a democracy as if we're in a Gestapo regime. Even in the Gestapo's of regime, the last time anything like that happened in the world where anyone was talking like that about these people was out of Hitler's 1933. And, and as such, I, I think that it's unfortunate, it's regrettable. I want to encourage the police and the army and all of those that have things to do with the election to be tempered. Obviously, if anybody is misbehaving, arrest him, take him to the police station, go and get him tried. I expect that, yes, the security should be there. I expect that citizens should behave themselves. Nobody should do brigandage. All we're trying to do is select leaders to run the country. But okay. that is no reason for any president or any commander-in-chief to issue such a directive. It is absolutely well, wrong. It's unacceptable. If anything happens to any Nigerian, then they must be ready to go down for war crimes. Okay, Coyote, were the president's words perhaps too strong? We are extremely happy that the president has reemphasized the powers entrenched in our constitution to our military 
our police and uh, security um, for, uh, secu security forces that they should not sit down like a booby uh, training uh, targets for uh, big grants for armed robbers for people who come to electoral places to behead our police, uh, police and, and soldiers and electorate. In our last elections, several policemen were killed, several electoral uh, uh, voters, peaceful voters were, were shot at, and the armed forces were, were, were sort of, uh, could not even do much because uh, quite a number, of, a number of them in River State were kidnapped. The president has, has emphasized what is entrenched in our constitution, that if you go to a police, to an electoral uh, uh, a place with guns, with arms, to shoot at uh, innocent bystanders who want to vote, if you come armed, that is armed robbery. The police will ne neutralize you. That is allowed by law. Where they can apprehend you peacefully, they will apprehend you. But if you come with AK-47, if you put, the, if you threaten the life of our military officers, our, our brave men and women, and the electorate, the, the law empowers the military to shoot back, and you will be paying with your dear life. But if you, for those, the majority of Nigerians who come to polling units peacefully, they come, they are able to conduct them to vote, and they're able to go home, and their votes are counted. And we were, we're not going to be rewarding ballot snatchers with flowers, because when these people come to deprive the electorate the, the opportunity to vote, they don't come with chocolate and sugar. They don't come with a spicy uh, 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 ice cream. They come with guns, with machete. If your researcher should go, should go online, now, you will see several men and women of our armed forces, several people that were killed by, 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 by political talks, they come with arms. And if they come with arms, with guns, the law, the constitution of the country supersedes every other law. It empowers our military to neutralize them. And okay. I have driven around the streets of Lagos. I was in Kano. People are extremely happy that we have a commander in chief that is going to protect the peaceful, loving Nigerians in this election. Okay, Shegun, uh, the president of your party. Um and former Vice President Atiku Abu Bakr. Let's just hear what he had to say specifically in response to, uh, to President Buhari's words encouraging police to use ruthless, ruthless uh, action against whoever might tamper with the election. Let's listen. If you are a professional military commander and officer and soldier and also a policeman, you are not bound to execute an order that is manifestly unlawful, no matter who issues that order. Uh, this is why I'm a bit confused. Shagun, I'll start with you. I mean, these are very civilized words he's asking for police uh, and security forces to just enact their professional judgment and behave according to the law and not respect what the president said in acting ruthless against people they suspect are tampering with the election. So why does Coyote and the president have such a different picture of these people threatening and intimidating and even, you know, killing voters, essentially, with their actions? Well, I think that from their fascist because attitude Atiku does not understand and the because they are later day converts Sorry. Go ahead, Shagun. And they are later they convert to democracy and the general capacity that they have to allow bloodletting and the bloodthirsty nature of their souls and the inability to respect that human lives are very, 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 very precious and that no leader should even be interested in the, in the maiming of his citizens and that control and commander-in-chief of the nation first of all means that you are going to be protecting lives and property of your citizens and that the instruction of the commander-in-chief must be measured in that such a exactly way that no one can doing. misconstrue it or no one can take okay. it as an excuse to misbehave. Unfortunately, Atiku has spoken the way a president should speak and he has tried to mitigate against it and to tell the police officers and the commander and the, that gentlemen, Remember that it's our citizens. Remember that their lives are precious. Remember that nothing un unto us will happen to okay. them. Pro use your professional discretion okay. as already covered any possible well, misbehavior by the populace. Shagun, let me get Coyote, Coyote's response. people to be killed The time is, is running out. Coyote, go ahead. First, let me... Let me first say that it's, a, it's, a compl it's completely untrue that the president has called on the military to go and kill innocent uh, Nigerians. Secondly, 
uh, Atiku just faced the first true test of a commander-in-chief. He does not realize the, the responsibility of a commander-in-chief. The responsibility of a commander-in-chief is to protect the lives and property of Nigerians, especially Nigerian citizens who are peace-loving. Secondly, he should also understand that the military uh, has said today that they will carry out, as empowered by the law, the orders of the commander-in-chief of this country. That is the pro to protect free citizens, free-born Nigerians who are going to go to the post peacefully and vote. But for those miscreants who will come with guns, with arms, to endanger the lives of our people, the, the military would use the full length of the law. And one part of the law is that if they are shot at, they will not throw cakes back at them. They will definitely use tax, uh, 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 guns provided by our people to protect innocent people. Gone are the days where people will go and behead the, uh, our soldiers and our electorate. Secondly, the president did not at any point in, in time order the military to go and start shooting at innocent civilians. The president said they must protect every peace-loving Nigerians. It is curious that it is that party that is now supporting ballot uh, box snatchers, okay. that, that, that they don't respect the sanctity of a democracy. One of the most important uh, pressures of being in a democracy is the right of people to uh, uh, vote and be voted for. And this president is ensuring that our people express their democratic rights in oh. a peaceful way. Okay. Koyote, let me ask you this, uh, because a number of Nigerians have complained that this whole debacle, canceling this general election just hours before the vote was supposed to open, and in the middle of the night so that people couldn't even know until they were already out and heading to the polls, it cost the state an estimated $1.5 billion. People are now looking for compensation. Um, people say that this has hurt Nigeria's image. Uh, an image that they've worked hard to build as a, as a leading democracy in Africa, that it's hurt Nigeria's image, and that that needs to be repaired to take, get this damage now off the country's standing. Do you agree? Do you I agree that... I Go ahead. I completely agree, and I share the sentiment, and our candidates and the party you represent share in that sentiment. This is not first, the first time that elections will be cancelled. This is the third time. And I think if we're going to, going to entrench the democratic process, we need to improve on how we conduct elections so that people will be able to uh, surely, uh, truly, freely choose their leaders without the expectation that they would, uh, their plans are going to uh, be disrupted. It is really disappointing, but that is also not to mention that we have improved a bit on our electoral process. Before now, politicians are able to allocate votes to themselves. What we the intro introduction? of the PVC, which is the permanent voter's uh, card, and the introduction of the card reader. Things are getting better. We will definitely get there. But this cancellation is uh, three cancellations too much. We are hoping that after this, there will be a bipartisan approach to make sure that our electoral process gives is free and fair so that there will be no cancellation and that people would have confidence in our electoral, electoral process. But again, these INEC officials are Nigerians. They operate within a Nigerian system, a Nigerian system where almost all segments of our society have suffered many years of, of, of of disillusionment, and they cannot perform magic okay. when they operate in an op or environment where things are not uh, are, are functioning well. But we're trying to improve on all this situation. Okay, Coyote, I'm going to have to give you the last word. Unfortunately, we are completely out of time uh, for this segment of the Newsmakers. I'd like to thank both of our panelists so much for joining us there from Lagos. Still to come, the UK revokes the citizenship of a Daesh bride. Politicians say it's for national security, but has the British government broken international law? And Geneva bans public employees from wearing religious symbols. Is this a victory for secularism or an attack on free speech? Where I can, and where any threat remains, I will not hesitate to prevent this. The powers available to me include banning non-British people from this country and stripping dangerous dual nationals of their British citizenship. Well, Britain has revoked the citizenship of Shamima Begum. She left the UK to join Daesh when she was just 15 years old. Today, she's a 19-year-old woman who just gave birth in a Syrian refugee camp. Now, Begum says she wants to go home. But the UK argues she is eligible for Bangladeshi citizenship. 
That's not true, according to Bangladesh. So Begum and her parents plan to appeal, accusing the UK of breaking the law by making her a stateless person. Let's cross to our panel in London now, and I am joined by Ajmal Masrur. He is an imam and a member of the Muslim Council of Britain, as well as Paul Stott, who is a research fellow at the Center on Radicalization and Terrorism at the Henry Jackson Society. That's a British think tank. Thanks both so much for joining us. Paul, let me begin with you. How is this legal? She may be eligible for Bangladeshi citizenship through her mother, but Bangladesh does not have to give her that citizenship. So she is therefore a UK citizen. Can they legally revoke that citizenship? Well, I think when uh, Shamima Begum decided to go to join uh, Islamic State, she did uh, purchase uh, a one-way ticket. So we're perhaps not, uh, not too surprised to be in the position that we are. The Home Secretary has a very difficult decision here. I think public opinion is, is broadly against uh, these fighters and uh, their supporters returning. Um, we've gone towards a policy of revoking the citizenship of dual nationals. It's quite a common process and I think a justifiable one. The question is what legal advice has passed his desk that's allowed him to take the decision that he has. And it's worth stressing the Home Secretary will see a lot more both in terms of legal briefing and intelligence than anybody else. So um, okay. that's how he's reached the decision that he has. But Paul, let me ask you this. I mean, 15-year-olds decide to do stupid things all the time. That is why civilized countries have separate sets of laws entirely to accommodate stupid juvenile behavior. Now, I know this seems extreme to choose to be a member of a terrorist organization, but she was 15. 15. Is there, is there no sympathy for that? Well, the age of criminal responsibility in Britain is 10, and we do routinely prosecute people for serious criminal offences at 14, 15, 16, etc., etc., and indeed we have for terrorist offences. I think there would perhaps be some sympathy if there was some sign of regret, but she actually seems to be saying very similar things as a 19-year-old to what she said when she was 15. So, so therein lies a further problem, I'm afraid. Okay, Ajmal Masrur, now she's an adult expressing the same sympathy for Daesh. Do you think there should be leniency on her? She should be allowed to return to the UK? You said it very clearly that she was groomed. She was 15 when she left this country. She was brainwashed and she went into a very terrible place, a place where no human being or no civilized people should ever live. But she did, and many other young people did too. The problem we have is that we cannot wash our hands off and say it's Bangladesh's problem. She was born in Britain, she went to school in Britain, she was radicalized in Britain, and she left Britain using her sister's passport, using our airport, escaping our own intelligence, our immigration as well as passport authorities, and quite easily slipping into Syria. These are all our failures. Now the Home Secretary, Sajid Javed, has made a huge blunder. He did not do his basic homework. He could have picked up the phone, and spoken to Bangladeshi Home Office Minister or Foreign Minister, who of course later on came on the media and made a public statement saying she has never been to Bangladesh, she is not a Bangladeshi citizen, and we will not be giving her or welcoming her in this country. Saadi Javed is stuck now. He doesn't know what to do. He will have to eat his very right-wing humble pie and swallow his ego and accept that this is a blunder he made. And it is not the first time the Home Office has made such, such, such blunder. If we are going to be consistent, though, that anyone who goes abroad or anyone who has got dual citizenship, we should strip them of their uh, citizenship, at least the British one, especially if they're adults. Let's start with the wife of Bashar al-Assad. She is a dual citizen. She lives and she supports uh, a tyrant who has destroyed, killed and obliterated a nation. And yet our Home Secretary, not one, several, have done nothing to strip her of her citizenship. I can give you many examples. Okay. I have no sympathy for anyone going to join IS or any such nutty group. I need to, of course, be very clear that they stand against Islam. Mm -hmm. They are totally responsible for their behavior. But legally, we cannot strip anyone of their citizenship and make them stateless. That is illegal. Sajid Javed has made a blunder, and he will need to okay. retract, and he will need to restore her citizenship. When she's back to the UK, she can be tried for her crimes. Okay, and Ajmal, I'd like to go back to the first thing you said, actually, uh, that she joined when she was a child. You said she was obviously groomed. We know that she was a victim of manipulation. 
Uh, let's also bear in mind that her husband in Daesh was almost twice her age. That alone is a crime. That is a rape. She just gave birth to a third child now, and she's still only 19, two of which died. She's still a teenager. Do you think there is a lack of understanding for a victim's psychological struggle in the UK? I'm a trained, I'm a trained counselor. I do lots of marriage and relationship counseling, and I take a great interest and deep interest in people's psychology. When I've seen the interview, and I've been seeing them very closely, it is very clear that this girl is very disturbed. If nothing else, she has been traumatized. Her psychology is not normal. She is not a normal human being. Grooming hasn't helped at all. Going to such a horrible place, seeing death and destruction everywhere, beheading of people and saying, I did not feel anything wrong with it. All these indicate that she, of course, is very disturbed. And most importantly for me, this girl has no knowledge of her faith. She had none whatsoever. The fact that she could not even see that her faith would completely and utterly dis uh, uh, distance itself from such behavior, she couldn't see. So I can see where she is coming from. I can see she is a disturbed person. She is a person who is psychologically affected. And we as people need to reach out to bring such people to our country because they belong to our country. They are our citizens. We need to put them behind bars. We need to do psychological assessment for them. And most importantly, we need to send out a very clear message. And that is we are consistent. We're not only upholders of law, we're not only propagators of justice, but we also establish justice in every facet of our society. Okay. Paul Stott, I saw you wanted to respond to something earlier. If you would like to, do go ahead. Yes, I must admit, as, as an academic in the field of, of terrorism studies, the grooming point is in many ways an erroneous one. Indeed, the, the research that the Henry Jackson Society's just published on the children and uh, families who've tried to go out to Islamic State shows it. What it tends to show is that boys who go out to join uh, IS and similar jihadist groups have, have tended to do so because of, of radicalized families. Women and young girls are much more uh, self-seekers. They look for information. These were three young women who followed out one of their friends who'd already gone and they were in contact with her and um, also the case that one of the three girls her uh, her father was involved in Al Maharuna a prescribed uh, terrorist group here in the the UK so there was a there was a radical uh, background in that case so I, I think the idea that people have been gro groomed or lured or that they're in some way vulnerable rather removes agency from them it's very patronizing we had a 30-year conflict in Northern Ireland and I can never remember anybody using this language okay. of people being groomed or lured at all it's uh, a very patronizing uh, 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 way that we, that we only really speak about Muslims in this way well it needs to stop and, and Paul I feel as if you let you, me let me let me uh, go go ahead Adma. I would like to challenge Paul on this. Paul, it's Henry Jackson Society you're talking about, an, an organization that is funded by the neocons, an organization that is established itself as non-credible, an organization that is establishing as well as uh, uh, publishing papers and, and, uh, and things like that that are erroneous, including calling me an extremist. I think, look, you can't sit there calling a, a kettle black when yourself as a pot has been rotted in your research. So we don't take Henry Jackson Society in any shape or form as an authority. Secondly, it is not true that she has not been groomed. Grooming is a major problem in our country. Kids are groomed sexually. Kids are groomed to commit suicide. Kids are groomed to take drugs and become pimps as well as drug dealers. And when it comes to Northern Ireland, give me one There's example of one Northern Ireland difference. terrorist whose citizenship has been stripped. Paul, look, be uh, genuine about it. You can't even pronounce the name of the it group that you've mentioned. It was routinely the case. It's Al-Muhajirun. That's well, a proscribed you... group. Get your facts right first, please. Paul, Wait, which one of the girls' fathers was involved in. Can I just say on the um, Northern Ireland point, for example, that we routinely passed uh, re uh, regulations against Northern Ireland terrorists, suspected Northern Ireland terrorists, that banned them from entering England, Scotland or Wales. Which, which of the so terrorists uh, citizenship was clear... stripped? Well, they had either British Which or Irish citizens okay, well, weren't you know, allowed our to enter. From Northern Ireland they weren't was allowed stripped. to enter the mainland UK. I, I don't want to get too far off track here because I, th I think at the core of this issue in particular is that this Shamima Begum is a child. She was a child. That could be considered, as we've heard before, a British problem. She was groomed in Britain. She was led out of Britain while she was being schooled in Britain. So, uh, Paul, let me ask you this. Might it not be good... Oh 
in a sense, for the UK government and British social services to have her back uh, in the UK under their care in order to work with her and find out what went wrong so that they can prevent this from happening again. I mean, technically, she is what could be the perfect case study. And I want to look at her now. We actually have a, a, a brief uh, bite from her mm. where she is asking for sympathy, in a sense. You can say she's showing little or no remorse, but I'll remind you that uh, often uh, victims do defend their abusers after they've been tortured for, for a certain amount of time. Let's listen to Shamima Begum. I was hoping that Britain would understand that I made a mistake, like a very big mistake, and it was because I was young and naive and I was newly practicing. I didn't know what Islam was and, you know, I just saw this, you know, big thing on the news, you know, Islamic State, you know, the Islamic law. I got tricked and I was hoping that they'd sympathize with me. Paul, is it possible that the UK here is being a little bit short-sighted? Who knows if she is non-remorseful and proves to be for, for the future, you can put her away where she won't be a danger to society. But if she's reviewed and it's decided she could become potentially a role model to help prevent this from happening again. It's fascinating to hear this argument that she should come back, be prosecuted, be de-radicalised, because what we've tended to hear from British Muslim representative organisations and uh, in, in part from British Muslim communities is usually the exact opposite. Enormous distrust or hostility towards counter-radicalisation programmes, the argument that they're uh, instinctively racist or discriminatory against uh, Muslims, and then over the past few days, a sort of full circle turning around that uh, she should come back and, and enter into those programs. Um, I would have no problem at all with a policy that prosecuted robustly those who've gone out to, uh, to Syria, who've gone out to fight for Islamic State, their supporters, their, uh, uh, their broader entourage. But I'm, I'm really questioning whether we have the type of society that would welcome potentially four or five hundred trials of British Muslims. As soon as that happens, I suspect we'd hear the usual excuses, the types of excuses we've heard in the past uh, around, um, you know, we've had people saying they went out to Syria, thought they were going to Turkey on holiday. Um, you know, really quite weedy excuses. And um, I, I fear a rerun of that rather okay. than people getting behind a proper investigative process. Ajman, let me get uh, your response. Go ahead. I would like to say that if, of course, uh, Shamima Begum is brought back and she's put behind bars for her crimes, if she's found guilty, I think everybody, Muslims and non-Muslims, all would say yes. It's a good thing and we are setting great examples so that no one else would do that. The problem with Prevent Program isn't the program itself. It's that those people who are delivering, they're the ones who are the troublemakers. They're the ones who are often Often not Muslim organisations. Countless Muslim, Muslim organisations so, so, involved in Paul, plans. I did not disturb you while I was speaking. So while you're speaking, just hold on. I'm saying that there are many people within the Muslim community who would be very, very good at looking at what went wrong with this girl. We could work together in partnership. That's not the issue. The issue is what the Home Secretary has just done is unprecedented. I'll tell you why. I, as a, as, as a young man, I was brought up in Britain. My parents come from Bangladesh. I was born in Bangladesh. If one a person like this can be stripped of their citizenship, what would stop any other Home Secretary from stripping people like myself, whimsically almost, by mob rule and by the advice given by people like you from my citizenship? You're making people like us stateless. And you know what? Citizenship is not a gift is not a privilege that you offer me because you are my master. No, I'm an equal citizen. I belong to this country. If I've done something wrong, just like you or anybody else, we are all entitled to a legal process. If I'm found guilty by due process, put me behind bars. And finally, look, if we are going to make a policy, we will all support the policy. And I've said this before. If any British Muslim would like to go out of this country and leave our country and fight against our own country, please do us a favor. Return your passport and leave. I've said that before. And I stand by it. But this girl was 15 and she was groomed. My point here is, let's make a consistent policy. Let's prosecute Sy Syrian president's wife, Bashar al-Assad's wife, right now. Let's also make a law that will stop anyone from going and joining any foreign army, including 
Israeli soldiers or British uh, Jewish people who go and join the Israeli soldiers and fight in the occupied territories, often causing uh, harm to the people of Palestine in the occupied land. So if we're going to make a law, we have to be consistent. I'm saying something very simple. Our country is, and most importantly, we need to protect its interest. Anyone who doesn't like our country, we need to stand against them, of course. Okay. But a girl who's 15, groomed, a country that was created by our failure and our illegal war, Unfortunately, we cannot wash our hands of our responsibility. And what Sajid Javid has done is terrible. He should be apologizing and reinstating her citizenship and returning her here so that she can okay. stel stand for trial. And, and uh, Paul Stott, let me ask you something. I mean, if this is about Britain's security here, having mm. a radical abroad is still a danger to the UK. Would it not be safer to bring them back and put them in a British prison where they can no longer endanger society from anywhere on the planet? Well, I think the, uh, the options in these cases are, are limited, as we saw with the Britons who went out to join the, the Taliban in the late 1990s and uh, uh, fought in places like Kashmir, Bosnia. Often, often getting an evidence trail in those circumstances is very different, is very difficult. It's potentially easier now because of things like social media. We, we know there are Britons who, you know, pose with weapons, who've uh, posed sometimes with uh, opponents that they've, uh, they've killed in battle. So, so the potential is there. But I can well see why the Home Secretary's taken the decision that he, that he has. His first job is the security of people here in Britain, an Islamic State fighters can't harm us if they're not in Britain. Are you sure about that? I was going to say, I can tell you how they can harm us, by Go making ahead, these propaganda and those people who've been brainwashed become a terrible enemy of our country. Did you know, Paul, I live with two death threats, one from the ISIS lot and one from the Al-Shabaab lot from Somalia. Both of those groups have give, issued death threat against people like myself because they can't stand the fact that we know our religion very well. We're authentic. We stand for our religion from the core of our faith, and we are 100% British, very confidently Muslim and very proud to be British. They can't stand people like that, like this. So you need to listen to our narrative. Our narrative is, let's create a home, our Britain, our country, which stands on law and international good stride. And secondly, let's create ethical foreign policies and let's promote democracy and rule of law in all parts of the world, starting off with here. The Muslim Council of Britain was dropped long ago for doing precisely the opposite of that from cooperation with um, government. Indeed, it spent a large part of its formation and since lobbying against pretty much every counter-terrorism policy that's emerged. So uh, I'm afraid I, I don't really buy these warm words. The difficulty also of turning this into a big theological argument is just as you're uh, an articulate uh, advocate for your religion, so are some people in Islamic states, so are some people in al-Qaeda. Al-Baghdadi, the founder, the leader of ISIS, the self-declared uh, caliph, his, the his, uh, his degree, PhD in the Islamic sciences. Abdullah Razam, founder of, uh, you know, the most, most important scholars, figure in the founding of al-Qaeda. Exactly the same background. Okay. Gentlemen, unfortunately, I'm going to have to interrupt you no, because it's we not are true, completely Paul. Most out of time for this segment. Ajmal, my apologies. Most scholars... The clock really is against us. Okay, I, I no would like to thank though, both of you really so much for joining us and uh, sharing your opinions and insights from, from both uh, sides there. Thanks so much for being on the Newsmakers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, teachers in Geneva, Switzerland have already been banned from wearing religious symbols. But now a new law in the canton has extended that ban to all public employees. That means no more Islamic headscarves, Christian crucifixes, or Jewish kippahs for government workers. Now, supporters of the new law say it will protect the separation of church and state, but critics have slammed it as Islamophobic, saying it unfairly targets Muslim women who wear a headscarf. So which is it? That debate in a moment, but first, here's Shamim Chowdhury. More than a century, Geneva has taken great pride in its secular ideals. The separation of religion and state has been enshrined in law since 1907. But over the past five years, there's been growing concern that those laws have become outdated. 
and do not take into account the city's growing religious diversity. They've now been updated, but some groups say the new law discriminates. It bans public workers from wearing visible religious symbols when dealing with the public. Sabine Tigmunin is the only councillor in Geneva who wears a headscarf. She says she'll no longer be able to take part in public meetings, which are a vital part of her work. I think this law was created to have control over religions and over Islam in particular. It will impact many professions because women in headscarves are currently working in childcare, as school assistants, nurses, doctors and pharmacists. These women will no longer be allowed to work. Either they will take off their headscarves or they will lose their jobs. 55% of people in Geneva voted in favour of the law. But it's not just Muslims who oppose it. Left-wing political parties, the Green Party, Evangelical Christians, unions and feminist groups have all expressed concerns. But the law's chief architect says it will ensure public workers put their civic duty before their faith. If these people feel they need to assert a right to be different as public workers, they have not understood which society they are in. Our society does not tolerate teachers with religious symbols, whether these are a large cross or a headscarf. We say to all communities, as well as Muslim communities, you are first citizens and then Muslims. Geneva has a long history of religious reform. It's widely considered to be the birthplace of Calvinism, a branch of Protestant Christianity that gets its name from the French reformer John Calvin, who settled in the city in the 16th century. Since then, Geneva has become a melting pot of different religions and ethnicities. It's home to around 400 religious communities. 35% of the population is Roman Catholic, 10% is Protestant and 6% is Muslim. The new law has been backed by the Protestant and Roman Catholic churches. Pascal Destus is the most senior clergyman in the Catholic Church in Geneva. He doesn't agree with the ban on religious symbols, but says some new provisions will ensure religion plays a more influential role in some aspects of society. This law brings some advantages, starting with the recognition by the state of the work of religions, for example the work in prisons or in hospitals. For us, it's important that this law provides a framework and safeguards that allow a good cohesion and which allow peace in Geneva. Opponents of the law have gathered around 8,000 signatures. They want to force a vote on the issue. Several legal appeals have also been launched. This law attacks individual freedoms and basic human rights. What is important is this law was created in Geneva, but it is against the federal constitution, against universal human rights, and against the European Convention for Human Rights. Tigh Munin now plans to teach young Muslims about their rights. She says the new laws have created a gap between the state and religious communities, and she wants to bridge it. Shamim Chowdhury, The Newsmakers, Geneva. Well, let's bring in Pierre Vanek. He is a member of the city's local parliament for the leftist Solidarity Party. Pierre, thanks so much for joining us. The separation of church and state versus freedom of religion or freedom of speech, whichever you choose to argue. Now, many argue, though, including in the United States, that you can be a secular state while allowing people the freedom to wear whatever religious symbols they want. Why do you think the canton of Geneva didn't see it that way? Well, uh, nearly half of the canton of Geneva, the half which I represent, uh, saw, saw it that way. There was a majority in Parliament against uh, this uh, freedom of, of, of religion and uh, of religious opinion in the public sector, in Parliament and in other, other matter, matters. Uh, I think uh, basically uh, uh, it's um, uh, 
reflex, uh, uh, retrograde and reactionary reflex. People are, we are in an uncertain times and people are trying to, to, to uh, hide or to, to protect themselves behind a, uh, an identity which is uh, uh, made also of uh, the, the classic uh, Genovese Protestant uh, okay. uh, Christian uh, identity, which is in contradiction with, uh, with uh, an open Geneva, which is an, another uh, aspect of, uh, of our city and our, our small state. Right. I mean, is it simply pure Islamophobia? Well, there is an, uh, certainly the, 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 the people who, who were in favor of this law uh, were not necessarily all Islamophobic, but they managed to, to mobilize, and maybe this was an, uh, uh, one, one, one uh, reason of their, their victory, they managed to mobilize a, uh, an Islamophobic sentiment in a, in a part of the population, uh, which is uh, something quite, quite sad, I would say, because Geneva is a, a tolerant open city normally, and uh, this shouldn't, uh, shouldn't exist here. Pierre, your party, Ensemble Gauche, uh, has submitted actually a new bill for parliamentary view that would exclude uh, this religious symbols ban. I want you to tell us a little bit about that bill and, and why you essentially think it just works better for everyone. Well, basically, uh, the, the, the ban is problematic. Uh, uh, Geneva is a very diverse uh, multicultural society. We have 40% uh, of uh, uh, residents in Geneva are, are strangers coming from all over the world. And we have a, a real melting pot in, in Geneva and in, in its population. I would like to see uh, the same uh, melting pot, the same diversity represented in, in the public services. There are more than uh, probably 50,000 people who are uh, in, in the, the, the scope of this, uh, this, uh, this bill to, to, who will have to, to hide, hide their, their, their religious opinions or, or identity when uh, uh, serving the public. That, that is not a satisfactory state of affairs. And it's particularly scandalous that uh, uh, parliamentarians, in my opinion, uh, we have a Christian Democrat party who, who is represented in parliament. They can say that they are Christians, but uh, any other, uh, uh, because they are a traditional historic uh, party in, uh, in uh -huh. Switzerland, but any other uh, political current having a, a religious re right. reference would be banned from, from stating it publicly in Parliament. I need to ask you though, Pierre, are you optimistic that your version of this bill will be passed? Well, I am optimistic that the, the struggle we have uh, uh, begun with this referendum, because the, 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 the present uh, bill was passed into, into law uh, with a very large majority of the Genovese parliament. 25% right. uh, uh, was the, the, the level of the opposition. We, we got it to a popular vote and we, we got up the opposition to 45%. So I'm confident that uh, maybe not tomorrow, but uh, in, in, in time we will get uh, 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 by our point of view uh, through argument, through discussion, will be recognized as being uh, uh, more democratic, more legitimate than the, 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 in the opposing view. Sure. In the meantime, though, there are pending legal challenges. I mean, how far do you think those will get? We'll get because the argument for freedom of religion and freedom of speech is very strong in a democracy. It is very strong indeed, and I am relatively confident that we can win. Uh, there are different different. Uh, um, uh, things that are being put in front of the, the, the first the local uh, Genovese uh, tribunal, constitutional court, and then we will go to the federal Swiss tribunal. It can finish, uh, it can end in, in Strasbourg maybe. Uh, I am moderately confident that we can obtain some, some successes uh, in this, uh, in this uh, area of, uh, okay. of uh, intervention. I have to mention though, there are other aspects to this law that its supporters hold up, uh, which include, for example, the voluntary religious tax that you used to be distributed between the three main churches will now be shared among all other religious communities. They say, see, this is not Islamophobia. We are applying this to all religions. We're actually making things fairer. Uh, is that progress? Well, 
Well, basically, if I can answer on that point, uh, basically, uh, today, the three traditional Christian religions are getting the product of this uh, voluntary tax. They have opened the system up uh, formally on paper. It is open to, to everybody, but no other religious community has asked to, 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 to benefit from this tax. Uh, Muslims haven't asked it. The Jews have not asked for it, uh, and other evangelical uh, religions haven't asked for it. And basically, my, my point of view is that in a secular state, uh, uh, the state shouldn't be uh, financing uh, religion by uh, taxes in any form or, or way. Okay, and just to conclude, should your legislation not pass as you've proposed it, should these legal challenges fail and these new laws stand as they are, where do you think that le leaves Swiss democracy, the tolerance that you are yourself very proud of? Well, it is a black. Uh, it is a black uh, mark, a black spot on. Uh, well, maybe not Swiss, but Genovese, because this is a local affair in the Canton of Geneva. You know, we are mm. a very federal state. Yes. It is a black mark against uh, human rights in in Geneva, and uh, I think uh, we will continue uh, our our fight until this uh, this black mark is removed. Okay. Pierre Vanek, uh, with that, we will leave it. I'd like to thank you so much uh, for joining us there from Geneva. That's all for this edition of the Newsmakers with me, Andrea Sankey. Remember to check out more of our stories on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Be sure to like, follow, and subscribe. Until next time, thanks for watching. Goodbye.